So, hey everybody, I'm Ellen. <laughs> I need no introduction. So I am super excited um, to come to you today with my new friends. Um, equity and inclusion in healthcare has been a passion of mine for some time. And I feel so grateful today to have the opportunity to bring together a group of incredible women who are on the forefront addressing these issues in inclusion and equity in healthcare. We wanna talk about this. We wanna get other people talking about it. And um, we're here to kick it off. So I'm with my partner, Sheena Williams, who is a cardiac telemetry nurse out of Philadelphia. And Sheena and I wanted to come together and start these conversations. So she's gonna introduce our doctors today. All right, so we have, so first of all, to introduce Dr. Uche Blackstock, um, funniest thing is that I saw one of your YouTube videos and the first thing you said in one of the interviews was, I'm sick of this bullshit. And I was like, yes. <laughs> That way, if anybody curses, we're all good. <laughs> so this is Dr. Uche Blackstock. Um, she is a Yahoo News medical contributor, and she's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. And then we also have Dr. Callie Cyrus, who is a community psychiatrist in DC. Um, she's also a diversity strategist, and she's the assistant professor at John Hopkins Medical Center. And then last but not least, we have Dr. or student Dr. Tumiche Fawole, who is a student at NYU. We're so happy to have you guys. We appreciate you guys for being here. Thank you yeah. for having us. For having us. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll start with the first question. Dr. Blackstock and whoever else wants to answer, feel free. How inclusive is the healthcare industry? Yeah, so the healthcare industry, um, medicine, and all the institutions affiliated with it have a lot of work to do um, with regards to equity and inclusion. So we know that you know, the number of Black physicians overall is quite small. We have 4% of all physicians are Black, 2% are uh, Black women. And we actually haven't seen those numbers budge for over, over like 40, 50 years. And so, you know, that is something that's incredibly concerning, but I think that speaks to uh, the, a lot of the structural barriers that are, are there. So we have a pipeline issue between kindergarten and, and 12th grade where, you know, we are not, we don't put a lot of money in this country towards education. So that's one thing. So we have kids graduating without a solid quality education, but we also don't have those kids being exposed to healthcare professions as an option, right? And then once they are in environments like college where they're pre-med or they ultimately get to medical school, those environments themselves can be pretty inhospitable. They have to deal with microaggressions, um, discrimination, um, not just from faculty, but from also their peers. So it's almost as if as every step along the way that there are barriers that, you know, that you know, Black Americans have to encounter to even become a physician. And then add on to that the financial constraints, you know, of going to, you know, going to college and then going to medical school is a, is a lot of money. People graduate medical school with six-figure debt, over $200,000. And so when you think about, you know, which families can afford that, when you think about the racial wealth gap that we have in this country, um, you know, black students are really at a disadvantage in being able to afford to go to medical school. So there are a lot of different factors, you know, that I mentioned that are really leading us to a, a situation where we have very few black physicians, we have, you know, few black uh, medical students. And I think, you know, we know that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the racial health inequities that, like, like the black maternal mortality crisis that we're seeing in this country. And I might actually just pick up where you left off. You're talking about pipeline programs. I wasn't even really going to talk about this, but so I'm the first person with essentially a graduate degree in my family, of course, the only doctor. And I had the benefit of being in a pipeline program when I was 13 mm -hmm. uh, that essentially gave me summers of, of biomedical research. And so I knew coming in that I wanted to be a doctor and multiple times almost gave up because it was just so difficult. No one really understood um, in my family what I really needed, being in, in a lot of these institutions where you know, I didn't have a lot of the social capital that everyone else did. And then I think when I actually did become a, you know, in residency, become a, a faculty member, you spend your whole life thinking of yourself as part of this community and you talk about inclusivity 
and you realize that you're not actually really included. So it, even when you do sort of jump over these hoops, you get to be in a community. And depending on, you know, I happen to be a multiple minority person. So as I'm cisgendered, but I'm queer and I'm like butch looking um, and also and also black. And I, I feel like so being inclusive. So imagine having to find a community that fits all of these identities right. and you right. feel safe. And that's also, I think, part of when I think of inclusivity is like, do you feel safe and included? And unfortunately, if there's only 2% of Black female faculty, how then are you supposed to feel right. included in this? There's not a mentor who looks like you to help sort of usher you into this community. Um, you feel isolated. Who do you go to at the end of the day to talk to about some of these issues? Um, the sense of gratitude, which is, you know, you've, you've gotten to this point. How do you sort of pave the way for other people who look like you? You always sort of feel like you're trying to do for everybody who looks like you, like the shoulders of all Black people or all Black women are on you. And then you can imagine that you inevitably fail, right? So there's no way that you can do all of that and exist and take care of your mental health. And so I think that um, everything you're saying, um, Uche, is, you know, starting from, <laughs> you know, the pipeline to actually becoming right. a physician and how that actually, right. yeah. Yeah. And actually, one thing I didn't mention is that so unlike Kelly, I'm a second generation physician. My mother was a physician and, um, you know, she had a very different upbringing than I did. She grew up in poverty. She was the first person in her family to go to college. Um, she had a born to a single mother, five siblings. She really str struggled significantly. And you would think even me seeing her as a physician would make things easier, right? But I still had um, imposter syndrome, right? Because of all this other messaging that you get that you're not enough, right? And so I only think about people who didn't have that, um, that role modeling, how difficult it's for them, if, it, if it's even hard for me. And then, you know, Ellen, you know, and, and Callie and Tumichi also know, but Sheena, I wrote a piece, you know, an op-ed in, in January about how I had, I had I'd left academic medicine because after being there for almost 10 years, I was doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, but I was, I was silenced. I was, I was muzzled, you know, and, and, and we were seeing these, you know, microaggressions and even racist and sexist, um, you know, interactions happening. And, you know, that's even for me as an associate professor having to deal with that. Well, I actually um, did look at one of your interviews and I thought it was amazing something that you said in there when you said they create these committees and boards for us to be a part of for inclusion, but they don't really want you to actually do anything. You know, they want, they want you on a, they want to say that they got the committee, but then when you actually start to actually make changes and speak up and talk about it, then it's like, wait, 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 no, no, no. We didn't actually want you to do anything. We just wanted you to pretend and kind of be there and be black. And that's all that we wanted. For them. Yeah, it yeah. For them. Right. Not for, them. for not for your community, for them. Right. And it's basically like you're a figurehead. So I was in this diversity role, but I really wasn't empowered to do anything, even though I had all of these, you know, these big and grand ideas, things I wanted to see happen, structural change, but I wasn't empowered to do it. And in fact, I was I was silenced um, and censored. And so you know, and, and it's not just that institution. A lot of institutions are like that. Yeah. And they do it subtly. It's the microaggressions. It's the small things. It's the, it's the different ways that they make you feel like if you say something, you know that it's going to come with something. It's not just going to end there. You know it's more to come. Well, well and, yeah. After, after a while, I was scared that I was going to be told to leave. Right. And, and, told, and told to leave because I was speaking the truth. And so there was that you know, confusion in my head because I said, I'm just doing, I'm just doing what's right. I'm, I'm just speaking the truth. Right. And so how am I, how, why am I getting in trouble for this? Right. And, and, and I think that, you know, nurses, there was nurses at one point in time that decided, okay, you do, you actually don't get a blood infection after three days. You get a blood infection after four days with an IV. They did the research, they figured it out. And now we changed IVs now can stay in for more than for four mm -hmm. days. That started with a nurse's station conversation that started with people talking amongst each other and right. then saying, hmm, this doesn't make sense. How can I make it make sense? Now let's do the research. Now let's study and let's change this theory or this practice. How are we supposed to use evidence-based practice when all the evidence is there, but we constantly keep ignoring it to make other people feel comfortable? How so are we supposed to get there? 
I know. So I'm going to interject here and I'm going to punt it to Tamisha because I feel like one thing that saved me when I was faculty is I was always kept going by the medical student. Mm. Just like so invigorated by mm. how much um, activism, especially when you're like a generation that's trapped in between, you know, the senior leadership mm -hmm. and then you have, you know, people who are younger than you are more junior. And I, I would love to hear what it was like for you as a student, what it's like, because currently you are a student, right? A medical student. Like, how do you deal with this when you see your mentors, like Dr. Blackstock leaving and you hear us talking about, mm. you know, inaugurated into this medical system as a physician? Um, that's a great question. So I think um, for me, my, my style has kind of changed. So um, I came in, um, and I was, I was student council president for a while. So for me, it was easy to kind of like leverage these conversations because I was meeting with these um, faculty members and these administrators already. Um, but I think that the one taxing thing is that, you know, as student council president, I had the ability to just plan fall formal and spring formal and like, you know, throw some things at an alumni ball and leave it. But like, I'm passionate about financial aid. I'm passionate about mental health services for like, you know, um, students underrepresented in medicine. I'm like passionate about getting, you know, several things changed. So I think it's hard from that standpoint because like, you know, you're trying to, you know, push forward this, you know, you're trying to push the envelope on what the institution is doing. But at the same time, you're still expected to score super high or like, you know, go go through your clinical rotations in Excel while, you're, while your peers are just uh, wondering or like concerned about which antibiotic to use for which UTI. And you're like meeting with, you know, deans to try to figure out how you can get language changed. So, I mean, it, it is great that like, I think especially the community that I've, I've fostered around myself is very supportive, but I think it can be very taxing when you feel like the onus for pushing certain things is on you rather than like the institution itself, if that makes sense. Right, it's a lot of pressure because you're not just expected to just be a physician. You know, you, you're expected to be the physician. Like you're, like Dr. Callie said, is like you're kind of like paving the way for others. It's so much extra pressure, so many, so many extra things that you're, you're worried about that someone else is like not even a thought in their head. And that's the thing is that if we communicate these things better, then there'll be better resources for everybody to feel inclusive when they're in these type of fields. So, Tanisha, do you feel like you have um, a, a group of friends who you can rely on? Do you, ha, have you been able to gather any little tribe to feel like you have each other or... I feel like it, at least in my class, the other uh, black students in my class, like we're very much like a unit. So I think um, not just in my class, but like the other like underrepresented minorities at my school, like are really very much like a, a cadre. So I feel supported in that sense. I don't feel like I'm the only one trying to do something. I think that we all like came here because we're all passionate about making a certain type of change. But I do think that Sometimes it does feel like a bit of a Sisyphean task because you're like, oh, we're almost there, we're almost there, oh. So I think that is, yeah, there is support, but it's still like, you're still kind of swimming against the current, if that makes sense. Yeah. And Callie, how does, how does, you know, the psychological toll of having to deal with this kind of pressure on top of the academic pressures, how, how would that affect a journey? It's... So, I mean, the first thing is that you, it affects your journey in that you know you have to get through it. Um, and I think that eclipses, like, mm. as you're actually suffering that you can, you can actually sort of process and acknowledge how much you might be suffering. So even if your circumstances, like you might be the only in every single class or in every single sort of rotation, you still know that you have to be work twice as hard is like the sort of the way to think about it. And so what I think that does, at least psychologically, is that, and I, and I can see this with myself, so I see how it's affected my journey, is that I'm so out of touch with when I'm actually upset or alone or scared or something. Mm -hmm. I've had to just keep on getting to the other end. And I mean, this is after someone who's been, and I've been in these kinds of institutions forever, right? So many of us are pedigreed, if you think of it in this way. Um, and now that I'm, I'm in a pretty safe place in terms of my professional life, but I find that I still have, I'm, I'm gonna call it like little t PTSD from my medical training, honestly. Um, so, you know, from the isolation, from the lack of mentorship, from having people 
who I can kind of resonate with when things like microaggressions or racist sort of discriminatory acts are happening to me, um, I've just learned to internalize it. And so I, I've gotten to a point where when things happen, it, it doesn't even, I, I don't even let it phase me until it catches up with me later. Um, and so you essentially, you have to become this like magical minority is what people say. You have to be able to do it all. And what I think it does is that it sort of erases you to be able to be a well-rounded human because your goal is always looking towards, you know, the journey, the end of the journey, right? Once you get into, you got to get into medical school, then you got to get into residency, then you get a faculty job. And then some of us who get faculty jobs, like Dr. Like Dr. Blackstock and I, you get there and you're like, what is this place? People are gaslighting you, right? I know, like people I know. are you know, demeaning you. And you're like, I, this is the dream I work to. And, and I, so, you know, Uchi and I talk about this since leaving academia. It's a, like life was really hard in academia. You know, you, I got my dream job um, after I, I finished residency for psychiatry at Yale and really got this job on paper that was remarkable. And within three months, I knew it was time to go. These are people that I'd known for four, for four years already. They were my mentors. Just, you know, doing things like denying that conversations ever happened, you know, not, not giving me administrative support when I asked for it, when I was clearly teaching and, and mentoring and doing all this. And I see it, I see it now, and I'm pretty frank about my mental health. And I, you know, I'm at this point where I, you know, I, I don't interact with as many people who don't look like me anymore. Like I'm, I'm nervous in some professional circles. Like I, you know, I, I'm not quite myself. And, and it's hard to say that I was like traumatized in some of these settings, but it's, I, I'm realizing like how much emotionally I shut down just to get through the journey. And then you get to the end of the journey and you're like, WTF, and I'm trying to do something. Like like last year, you remind me, like, you know, last year I was promoted to associate professor and I, I think I was like one of three. This is like a women. feat, by the way, to be yeah, yeah, like, promoted to associate professor. And, and then I realized I had to fight for that promotion. Like I literally had to fight tooth and nail, even though everyone had said, oh, Uche, you're totally, you're, you're, you're a shoe in right? And things did not happen the way that they were supposed to be. And I couldn't help but think that this was because I was a Black woman and the work that I did was not being appreciated fully the way it should have been. But the fact that I walked away from an associate professor position and, and half my department was looking at me like I was crazy, but I had had enough. I, I, I wanted to be in an environment where my voice was heard and appreciated, where my work was appreciated and valued. And... It just wasn't in this environment and I wasn't the first and that's the other thing and uh, to me she knows this like I wasn't the first black woman to leave like this I, I, I bet they were a trail of bodies so to speak well I right? think that, 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 that came before me Go ahead. I think that one of the big the huge things that both of you said was that you left dream jobs in very short amount of time and you know what's funny is that other people see it as a short amount of time, but truthfully, your journey has been so long with this that right. by the time you got there, you ain't had no more left. Right. Like right. seriously, because right. you don't. They, people think like, oh, she was at that job for three months. She was at that job for however much time. So like, how could she have possibly gone through enough? But no, 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 baby, we've been going through this for a long time. So like, that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Like, we've yeah. been having these struggles and these issues and these problems, and you get to a point where you're just like, enough is enough. You're doing so much, and like, like, like uh, Tumiche said, you're already dealing with the stressors that are normal, the normal stressors of doing your job. So then to have cases of harassment, cases of being silent, cases of feeling like you're inadequate, cases of feeling like you're judged more harshly than other people, it, it hinders you from doing your job and it makes you almost feel like you're operating from behind something. Like I'm showing you a different person than who I really am because I literally am not mm -hmm. allowed to be who I am. Well, 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 that's the other thing. And you know, we talk about like code switching in, in different environments, but you feel like sometimes you really can't be yourself, right? You can't really say what your truth is or how you really feel because you have to worry about the repercussions of that, right? You know, I mean, there are even some things, I don't mean to put her on the spot, but that Timmy Shea is probably not gonna say fully because she's still a medical student, right? And because you know, she has to worry about what, what are the repercussions if she says something that the school's not happy with. 
And this was a big concern of mine when I thought about this panel. Um, I really wanted to make sure that all of you felt good about this and I wasn't putting anybody right. in an awkward situation um, and why I appreciate even more all of you coming and speaking. Um, and, and, you know, what stands out to me is just what Sheena just said is like, how are you supposed to give 200% to your patients um, or to your students, you know, when you're dealing with all these other pressures, you know, it's just so unfair. And so systemically, Uche, can you speak to, clearly the system is set up to be racist. And can you speak a little bit about how these systems have been set up and, and, and what ideas maybe we could implement to start to break those barriers down? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because I think especially with healthcare and medicine specifically that the racism is so, so embedded. Like it's from the beginning. Like when I, when I do talks and trainings for my organization, I talk about, uh, you know, uh, a doctor named J. Marion Sims, right? He was, he's considered the father of modern gynecology. He created the vaginal speculum that many of us have used on us when we go for our annual gynecological exams. But he also was a slaveholder, and he also experimented on Black women who were enslaved um, these, using these very painful procedures, right? And so what, we, what we've had is this really deep, horrific history of how medicine has essentially abused and exploited black black communities for centuries right and so you know i talk about j marion sims i also talk about tuskegee right the tuskegee syphilis study where you know you have men from the 1930s to 1970s being enrolled in a study by the u.s public health service they were told they had bad blood but they actually had syphilis and they and, and a good number of them were not treated even though a known treatment was available penicillin and many of them ended up developing advanced syphilis they ended up uh, transmitting syphilis to their partners and as well as babies had congenital syphilis so you know i you know it, i you know this is not going to change in a overnight <laughs> it's probably not going to change over a few you know a, over a few years but i think that um, healthcare institutions have to be more intentional and, you know, we hear about anti-racism a lot. You know, I think we have to really, like we're doing now, talk frankly about what racism does in terms of, it's, it's a sickness. It makes people sick. So all the racial health inequities that we're seeing, the high Black maternal mortality rate, that is racism because there's no biological reason why Black women should have a higher maternal mortality rate than white women. There's no reason. And all yeah. of that is because of, practices and policies over the years, like redlining, right? Redlining, um, the GI Bill, um, even, even- um, What is redlining? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, so, sorry, sorry. So, so redlining is this federal policy in the 1930s that assigned grades to different neighborhoods there was throughout, throughout the country and cities. And basically A, B, C, or D, and you got a poor rating, a C or D, if your neighborhood was mostly black or some sort of ethnic minority, and you got an A or B if it was mostly white, and, and the significance of those grades were if you got a higher grade, you were more likely to be to qualify for a federally backed mortgage. So you were actually able to buy property in mostly in, in white neighborhoods, and, and black folks and other ethnic minorities were not able to qualify. And so, but what, what the what the interesting part about that people say, so what does that matter now? When you look at redlining maps, the neighborhoods that have those lowest ratings, and you superimpose present day life expectancy, asthma rates, um, obesity, uh, those are the same neighborhoods that have, um, you know, those inequities, right? And so- Yes, you I, I thought you were referring to, some, I thought oh. there was a, d a different redlining oh. specifically oh, no. for health oh, no. so, but right. you're just talking. But but, but yeah, I'm just okay. saying how how there are there are there are practices and policies even that were sure. sanctioned by our own government that have created these profound inequalities. And so we we know that we can actually tie residential segregation to health outcomes. So the so that so the the policies that enforced residential segregation in the 1930s, you can actually tie it to now because we know that where people work, where they play, where they live 
all influences their health at a neighborhood level, right? And so I think if we do want to change systems, right, we have to really look at giving people gainful employment, opportunities for home ownership, opportunities for quality education, because also what happened out of redlining, if no one is able to buy property in a certain neighborhood, then what's funding the schools, right? And, yeah. and, and so, it, I, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, no, no. I, I, I have a, a black man who lives in a, in a, 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 a I guess, a affluent neighborhood in Los Angeles, and police knock on his door and say, someone saw, a neighbor saw you walking right. into, into, into here. So, you know, it just doesn't stop. It's like, right. and, you are in an affluent neighborhood and your neighbor sees you, and your white neighbor sees you, they're gonna knock on the door and say, I saw a black man go into that house because right. there's no black man that live in this neighborhood. That couldn't right. be. Right. right, and it's like, you just, you just can't live and you can't exist. And there's this like, there's this racism iceberg I talk about in my talks where, you know, a lot of times we think about racism as these interpersonal interactions, right? These, you know, people using a racist slur or a microaggression, but really what racism is, the bulk of it is, these policies and practices that have been around for a very many, for a long, a long, long time that have, have really disadvantaged um, black communities to the point where we, we've been made sick. We've been made sick. So when we have COVID-19 coming, right? And you look at who's dying, we're dying, right? Because not only do we carry the highest burden of chronic disease, but we're more likely to be essential workers. We're on the front lines in public facing jobs, more likely to be exposed to the virus. We're living in overcrowded housing. We're using public transportation, right? So it's almost as if these conditions have been created to make, to make our communities sick. And so what's gonna be needed is a lot of work and a lot of really intentional funding. It's putting, putting resources, funding back into black communities. And one thing that I wanted to um, highlight that you said is that you know, these experiments that were done on slaves that were for like forced surgeries, no pain medications, no like, you know, terrible things were done to these slaves. The research from those, those that experimentation is what we use for our medical books. So we can't, it has to be, it has to be from the very beginning, because if you're making our practices and our anatomy books and all of these things based on the racist people that did what they did and cruelty and evilness, how in the world, it, it, it all goes hand in hand because the universities are affiliated with the hospitals. So it right. all goes, it is all one, one big circle of nonsense. Actually, Sheena, that's such a great point because um, the HeLa cells, you know, this Henrietta Lacks uh, was a young black woman who presented to Johns Hopkins with metastatic cervical cancer. Her cells were taken from her without her consent and they were immortalized. So companies have made billions of dollars off of using her cells. I used them when I was a first, first year medical student in Harvard Medical School. No one told me where these cells were from. But the interesting thing is they're actually using her cells for research and development for the coronavirus vaccine. And, and I mean, the, what, what, what her cells have done, I mean, so many discoveries have been made because of her cells, but she's never been fully acknowledged, right? And that, that's it, how insidious this all is. Right, right, right. right. Here you have this, this woman whose cells were taken from her and like trillions, you know, probably more than trillions. I don't even know the yeah. numbers been made off of her. And so we're talking about equity and changing systems. I mean, honestly, I think the approach I take is that that money, need, the money and the acknowledgement needs to be mm -hmm. put back into the system. Yeah, Maybe I agree. Like come back to the medical system in general. I think one of the points I really wanted to make was was maybe a, around NIH funding, but I think it's about funding in general. So if you value equity and inclusion, then put your money where your mouth is. And right. so now we're thinking about coronavirus, right? Some of it is that we know black people are getting infected more easily, their consequences are worse, but it like think about who's doing the research. How do we even, how do we study black people in the first place? I know Sheena, you were just talking about textbooks, right? Think about who does all the research and who gets all the research money, right? So white, white researchers are 1.7 times more likely to get NIH funding to, and they're more likely to be doing research on like molecular science when black researchers actually tend to study clinical issues right. that have to do with black people. So if they're not actually getting any money, black researchers aren't getting money to do research on black bodies, then how do we ever move the needle forward? If you don't right. hire black faculty in these institutions, 
then how does it ever change? How do you bring up the fact that we in our classrooms need to be acknowledging where these healer cells come from, right? Right. And so it, it's, then you just end up getting mm -hmm. generations and generations and generations of this unacknowledged sort of like racist trauma and trauma. Trauma. trauma, 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 right? And then we just keep replicating it and throwing lip service to it. It's, yeah, and yeah. so I, 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 I keep like, I'm not saying your name correctly and I'm so sorry, Tamisha. Oh yeah, you, it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> How do you even, is this part of the conversation where you are? So, oh, yeah. Are. oh yes. <laughs> it's not really as much part of the conversation as it should be. I think a lot of what we discuss, I mean, sure, if you really want to, you can take, you know, an elective that's, you know, does a deep dive into some of these topics. However, it's not really integrated um, deeply into the curriculum. You know, a lot of times, like, you know, like in the activist circle, my friends, like, we'll talk about these issues and there's just kind of no baseline understanding in, in our classmates at, at some level sometimes, sometimes with like even some members of like faculty. Um, and I think that can be kind of hard to push the needle. And I think for me, it's, it's particularly frustrating sometimes because you know, as doctors, the amount of reading, you know, we do like, you know, continuing medical education is such a big thing. You know, there's such a knowledge of like the newest, you know, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. However, like talking about structural barriers that, it, uh, that affect black people in particular and other, you know, minoritized communities like kind of takes a back seat, you know, and people uh, profess their ignorance, which at, at a certain point, obviously nobody, you know, is perfect. Everybody is continuing to learn. However, for me, I think the most frustrating thing is kind of the lack of prioritization of these issues. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of is relegated to a, a type of pseudoscience, whereas, you know, the, the molecular basis is the true hard science and, and everything else, that's soft science, that's social. We don't really care about that, which is right. like, but I mean, I mean, of course, molecular science is important, but in terms of like tangible actual outcomes, like your patient in front of you doesn't care about their germline mutation. They care about how you talk to them. So... <laughs> I mean, of course their germline mutation like influences care, but without like a structural understanding of how that patient ended up presenting to you, like you're not really doing anything for the patient. Um, yeah, and it, actually I, I had a very interesting experience where I was talking to someone not too long ago about, um, so just to, to, to give a little bit of a backstory. So there's a lot of different scores that are calculated in medicine if you have a particular disease. So for example, if you have like heart disease, for example, there's something called the ASCVD score. Um, so basically what this does is it, it, it helps calculate what types of treatment would be best for you based on your certain risk factors. However, some of the, the inputs into that are based on studies that have been proven to like not encapsulate like full measures of, of sensical health, if, I'm, if I'll be frank. So for example, there's a study that um, tested a type of heart disease medication, but it only tested it in black people. So once you then put in race characteristics, a specific medication is recommended to you over another medication only because there was one very, very small study that was only done in black people. So you're getting a different medication. When again, as Dr. Blackstaw said, there's no real evidence for any biological differences in people, but because people have, you know, kind of, anchored onto race-based science and bought into these genetic differences instead of thinking about social determinants of health, social determinants of health and environmental causes, like we end up having different outcomes and are prescribed actually different medicine based on these calculators. Wow. That was a lot. That was amazing. <laughs> that was a whole lot. Yes. That was incredible. Yeah, and I want to just ask Tumisha, when you have these moments, because I know when I was in nursing school, um, they said to me, uh, oh yeah, um, your mucosa should be pink and your this, your labia should be this. And I was like, my labia don't look like that. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just want to know, when I said that, it was like a, who you talking to? Shh, don't say that. You shouldn't be saying that. But I'm like, no, 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 no. This don't look like me. You saying that my gums should be pink when I know many Black people with brown or purple gums or dark blue or yeah. whatever. <laughs> right. So if you're if you're an average, if you're somebody who, let's just say, because I had plenty of um, people that were that were not people of color that were in my nursing school that 
were from towns where the, everyone looked like them. So how would they know how to diagnose someone? If I see somebody mm -hmm. with blue gums, I'm gonna assume they're cyanotic, you know? So I wanna know, I know my experience wasn't pleasant. I wanna know from you, Tanisha, when you bring up those type of moments, when you say anything, is it a hush moment? Does everybody look at you like, oh, did she say that? Or is it like a, like, how does that work for you? I think for me, I'm, I'm actually pretty outspoken. Okay. Um, so, I mean, depending, I mean, I'm just going to say it. And if you, if you have, I mean, your reaction is kind of, hopefully like you take it as a learning moment. It's never like, it's never an opportunity to dunk on anybody. Cause that doesn't like, that's not productive either. However, like I'm also not going to shrink myself to make you feel comfortable. Exactly. So I think it, it, peer wise, it goes that way. But sometimes where it's difficult is because, mm -hmm. um, when you're like in, a, in a, a clinical rotation setting where you're talking to residents or you're attending, so we're directly grading you, then things get a little, you know, you're a little more reserved or sometimes you're just like, I'm gonna swallow that and move on, which can be right. I think, frustrating. But I think among my peers, I just, it's like, this is a good teaching moment. Um, again, sometimes it's not that I'll have a whole lecture. Sometimes I'll be like, this is a great opportunity for you to read. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it's easy when you have a peer to peer relationship. The issue comes when you, you're, you're, um, lower in the social the power level. dynamic, right? Exactly. Yeah. Then you're kind yeah. of, okay. <laughs> yeah. I have a story that might be interesting. This is why it's important for not just to be one black person per class in a medical school. Why there's needs to be more professors and people who are teaching. Um, because people come from these small, not necessarily small towns, but we come from limited circles, right? We tend to cluster with people who look like us, who we're comfortable with. And so when I was do, I would teach this class to it's usually health disparities and racism and privilege, like everything piled into one because they give you one lecture, right? To the medical students. And I would teach it to them to first year medical students at Yale. And I, ha I use clickers when I do my workshop. So there's this, um, you can text you can ask questions to the audience and they can text them their answers anonymously. And so I would ask them questions like, what's the background of your parents? How many of them are doctors or lawyers? And you could see the makeup of the class. And inevitably I would get to this question that said, um, would you cross the street? You're walking down the street at night and a tall, dark black dude is walking toward you. Do you cross the street? Be honest. And most people would say that they would cross the street. And so we would always end up getting into this conversation about why. And I remember in terms of talking through the solution, some of that was like, next time you are gonna cross the street, ask yourself why you would cross the street, right? Like, why is it? And so, so many people come from places where they don't have these conversations, they're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. And, but I think the, even like the meta layer on top of this is that one of the suggestions was reach out to these people and not necessarily like put the onus on them, but reach out to them and get to know people who don't look like you. And then I remember, and Uche, you know, Max, um, he's a friend of ours, um, that, that he's a tall black dude. Essentially after this lecture, he got like five emails from his classmates to have coffee. <laughs> and so, bless they were because they, they, they were literally taking right because he was the <laughs> only one they knew. And I tell this story because it just illustrates. It's like a it essentially gap. Everything we're talking about, right? Is that you don't have space for this conversation. You do have a conversation, but you end up there's not as many people to have a conversation with. There are not as many examples. I just think it encapsulates so many layers of everything we're talking about. Can't tell you how many students have sent me an email afterwards saying, you know, I'm from a small town or my experience, I had this X experience happen. Do you have any advice? And it's something that I just wish we were able to actually discuss, but it's it's hard to find a centralized one there's educationally. Like, how is this included? But then also, I mean, the greater landscape of just, I, I, I'm like rambling at this point, but I, I'm gonna stop. No, yeah, no Kelly, it's, it's actually, sorry to cut you off, Shana. No. Kelly, it's, uh, it's actually one of my um, biggest criticisms about this current sort of revolution that we're ho hopefully experiencing. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I have conversations with all of my black girlfriends about it, and I've, I've yet to sort of publicly say it. Um, because I, I, I'm afraid to come off too critical, but I see lots of, you know, posts on Instagram and, and I, and I see lots of white people trying to do the right thing, bless their heart. But on Instagram is one thing and blacking out your Instagram and okay, but I want to know who's in your life. 
you know, reading and, and listen, I did not read enough books. Um, and, and I, and I have started to read more. And I, I guess I felt like because I have so many black people in my life and Asian people and people of color in my life that I didn't need to necessarily read books. I, I'm not a big reader anyway, to begin with, but I, there, during this whole thing, I said, I need to read more and I need to, I need to dive more into the academia of racism, right? Because that's something I have never delved into. But one of my biggest criticisms of white people during this whole thing is like, okay, so you're posting, okay, so you're marching, that's all great. And I don't want to criticize that, but who are you eating dinner with? And who are you going out with? And it, who are your friends? 